And good evening, and welcome to another episode of the Prince Hall Think Tank, a monthly conversation amongst Prince Hall Freemasons, where we discuss topics relative to craft masonry. My name is Brother Antonio Caffey, and I'm a very proud past master of St. Mark's Lodge Number 7, located in Columbus, Ohio, where Worshipful Brother Vance Williams serve as um, our Worshipful Master. My lodge was given a charter in 1852 by the Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Ohio, where currently the Honorable Chester C. Christie serves as Most Worshipful Grand Master. Uh, before I let the other brothers introduce themselves, I would like to state that the views and opinions that are expressed by us this evening in no way reflect the views and opinions of the Grand Lodges and Lodges in which we hold membership in. Also, as always, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat option, which many of you have already started to do on our YouTube page. And if we have time at the end of our conversation this evening, We'll see if we can answer some of them for you. All right. So at this time, I'll let the other brothers introduce themselves, starting with Brother Morgan. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to once again be here on the Prince Hall Think Tank this October 25th, 2020. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here and welcome Brother John Williams. Uh, Brother John B. Williams here with us tonight. It's his first time uh, in the house with us here on the Prince Hall Think Tank, and I'm sure we're all going to make him very welcome. I'm glad to be here and excited for this discussion tonight. Uh, I'm just th I'm just thrilled because because y'all y'all know this is a, tonight's focusing on DC, so I know I'm kind of in the hot seat tonight a little bit, but uh, but I'm just thrilled to be here. Thank you, brother Morgan, brother Jack. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, brother Damian Jack, proud past master of Paul Drain Lodge Number Seven, where brother Lonnie McBride serves as our worshipful master. Our lodge is under the auspices of the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of North Carolina, where the Honorable Daniel L. D. T. Thompson serves as our 24th most worshipful Grand Master. It is an honor and pleasure to be here with you this evening. Definitely looking forward uh, to this show. We know that uh, this topic has been a uh, topic for ages. So looking forward to uh, uh, tackling this and, and ready for a great show this evening. Thank you, Brother Gillon. All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Brother Dave Gillarm, past master of Mount Pisgah Lodge number 53, located in Columbus, Chart I mean Columbus, Georgia, where we were chartered December 21st, 1888. And uh, Christopher Ganey serves as our worship master. Uh, also have the pleasure of serving as the worship grand historian of the most worship prince of Grand Lodge, Georgia, where the Honorable Corey D. Shackelford Sr. serves as our 18th most worship grand master. Uh, as Brother Jack stated, you know, this uh, interesting for this conversation. Uh, this has been a topic that's been debated in various group, uh, Facebook groups, internet groups, uh, for quite some time. So, I'm looking forward to for, to tonight. Thank you, brother Gillard. And um, since we have a very, very special guest on this evening, we usually let our guests introduce themselves. But I, I, I wanted brother Morgan to to first roll out the red carpet for our very special guest this evening and start off his introduction. So, brother Morgan. No problem, no problem. And uh, by the way, because I didn't, I didn't give my usual introduction because I get so I get nervous sometimes. So y'all forgive me. <laughs> I, I, I realized after I got done talking, right? I was like, oh, I'm oh, you something. skipped everything, right? Right, right, right. <laughs> I, I, my name is James R. Morgan III. And I'm a past master, of Corinthian Lodge 18, where Davian Gregory is my worshipful master, and uh, I serve as the worshipful grand historian and archivist of the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of the District of Columbia, where the Honorable Quincy G. Gant is presiding as our most worshipful Grand Master here in the nation's capital of Washington, D.C. Um, so uh, the reason why I'm talking again, obviously, is because I'm introducing uh, someone who is a, I consider to be a, a dear friend, uh, a mentor, uh, a brother in Freemasonry and in Masonic historical study. I speak of none other than the Honorable John B. Williams. Um, Brother Williams is a uh, member of the jurisdiction of California. He is a avid, avid reader and researcher of Masonic uh, history, symbolism. He is a published author several times over. As a matter of fact, his, and I'm sure he'll talk about it tonight. Uh, his, his latest publication is The Prince Hall Story Revisited, uh, which he published, I believe, either early, at the beginning of this year or, or late in 2019. Um, 
He's published several other works, not only articles, but also other books. He has a, a book uh, entitled uh, The Fourth Age, which I highly encourage you all to check out. And I'm sure that he will um, let you all know how you can purchase those books as well. Um, Brother Williams has the distinction of serving in a position that I think um, many of us uh, don't truly appreciate in that he uh, has served as president of the Phylaxis Research Society. Uh, as you see I'm, my, by my shirt, I'm wearing a Phylaxis shirt because I am a, a life member. Uh, and, and, and I highly encourage all of you to join and for the sisters to join the Phyllis uh, Auxiliary as well. Um, Brother Williams uh, followed in the footsteps of the late, great Joseph Walks, who you've heard us talk about time and again, and he was a personal uh, confidant and friend uh, of Brother Walks as well, as, as well as many other great Masonic scholars who've since gone on to heavenly reward. And so we're, tonight we, we have a living legend in my view. And I don't say that just because he's here. And I don't say that just because he just sent me $500 to my account and sent another $500 to Dave Gillarm. I'm not, I'm not doing that. You know, uh, I'm saying it because it's the truth. And so I, I, I'm just overjoyed that we were able to get him here tonight and get him on camera. So with that being said, uh, Brother Williams, how are you feeling this evening? Good, sir. Please, uh, I'm going to bring you off mute. I'm Thank doing you. good. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Brother Williams. Williams. Yeah, you're, you're, off, you're off mute, Brother Williams. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, can I announce my lodge all and means, all please. that other good <laughs> stuff? Okay. Um, I am a proud past master of Prince Hall Lodge number 17, um, originally in San Bernardino, California, where um, the worshipful David C. Moore is our worshipful master. Uh, we come under the jurisdiction of California, most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of, Cal of California, where Samuel T. King is our Grand Master. And if I may, I'd also like to give a shout out to the Honorable Alex Smith, who is president of the Flaxic Society, where I did serve as its third president. I want, and let me express my appreciation for you brothers asking me to participate uh, on this forum. Thank you. I thank you, Brother Williams, for, for again joining us. So um, as we stated tonight, um, we're gonna discuss a very interesting topic. Um, you know, although William Grimshaw's book the history of Freemasonry among colored people um, of North America is over 100 years old. You know, although many of the stories that he's told, you know, regarding Prince Hall history uh, within the book has been proven false. And still, you know, in 2020, you know, we're still dealing with a, um, a, a lot of tales and fantasies around some of the, the, the stories that he told in the book. So tonight, we're pleased to have Brother Williams with us to discuss the importance um, of that that particular book, um, the research that he's done. So hopefully we can share some some light or more light on Grimshaw's book. So without further ado, Brother Williams, the floor is yours. Okay. You want me, Brother Williams, ready for your presentation? Yes. All right, I'm pulling it. I'm putting it up now, so you can just hit play. Okay, um, William Henry Grimshaw was a Prince Hall Mason and a lot more is gonna be said about him later tonight. I just wanna make, uh, give you some idea of when he lived. He was born in 1848 and he died in 1927. So coming up on close to a century. Grimshaw published a, a book uh, 117 years ago, that was in 1903, and we're still talking about that book today. It turned out to be quite influential and very controversial. It was controversial because historians suspect parts of it to be wrong, and the errors have been widely quoted by others who often fail to cite Grimshaw as their source. It has been influential because the scope of Grimshaw's book is impressive, as you can see from the table of contents. It touches upon the early history 
of 42 Prince Hall Grand Lodges in the United States. It discusses the National Grand Lodge, Masonry in Canada, the Knights Templar, Royal Arch Masons, the ancient accepted Scottish Rite, and a great deal more. Grimshaw worked as a doorman in the Library of Congress, so he had easy access to a massive body of reference materials. Prince Hall Grand Lodges must have found the book to be very useful because the first draft of their history was written for them and published in Grimshaw's book. Grand Lodge historians could go to their proceedings and verify a lot of what Grimshaw wrote. And this might have convinced them that Grimshaw was right about everything, other things in, her, in his book. The problem is that not everything in Grimshaw's book stands up to close scrutiny. When it comes to Prince Hall's early life, as discussed in chapter eight, and the origin of African Grand Lodge as discussed in chapter nine. Some of Grim Grimshaw's story cannot be verified in Grand Lodge proceedings or anywhere else after more than a century of searching. Still, a sizable number of 20th century historians found the book to be invaluable and used it as a trusted reference. Then in the late 1970s, evidence was uncovered that Grimshaw used a forged document to support his claim that England appointed Prince Hall as a provincial grandmaster. I discussed this document in depth in the first three chapters of the Prince Hall story revisited. And this forged document is what I will discuss tonight. My focus will be on this one item, just to show that Grimshaw was willing to create and present false evidence. This weakness in his character speaks to his credibility as a historian. To help you appreciate my objection to Grimshaw, you should know that I like the guidelines used in the American legal system for evaluating the credibility of witnesses. And the following guideline is pertinent. If you find that any witness has intentionally testified falsely as to any material fact, you may disregard that witness's entire testimony or you may disregard so much of it as you find was untruthful and accept so much of it as you find to have been truthful and accurate. And this was taken from the state of New York guidelines, which are also printed, uh, printed in Appendix A of, of the book. Grimshaw published in his book, a patent of, appoint, of, of appointment that he claims he found in Philadelphia. He says that the Grand Lodge of England appoints Prince Hall, the provincial grandmaster for North America. It took more than half a century for this audacious document to become Grimshaw's undoing because it turns out that the Grand Lodge of England keeps excellent records. In 1976, George Draffin, a deputy grandmaster from Scotland, wrote a paper called Prince Hall Freemasonry for publication in the Proceedings of Lodge Cueto Coronati number 2076. During peer review of the paper, the Grand Librarian of the United Grand Lodge of England, Brother T.O. Haunch, found an earlier version of Grimshaw's patent 
in the archives of the United Grand Lodge of England. Here is a photocopy of that document. It says that England authorizes Prince Hall to establish a provincial Grand Lodge in Boston and to establish regular lodges elsewhere in America. The date on this document is 1790. Here is the cover letter that accompanied Grimshaw's suspicious patent. Grimshaw asked England if they could find any reference to such a patent. Grimshaw's letter was addressed to the Grand Secretary of the United Grand Lodge of England, who very likely sent the letter to the Grand Librarian, Henry Sadler, for, evalu for evaluation. I have not seen the actual letter Grimshaw received from England, but this handwritten graph, draft thought to have been written by Sadler very likely formed the basis for the Grand Secretary's official response. Sadler states that Prince Hall never was so appointed, and he lists four errors that prove Grimshaw's document could not possibly be genuine. It is clear that Grimshaw received these comments because all of these errors were corrected in the, revive, in the revised patent he published in his book. Once again, here is a patent published in the book. Note that the date of the patent is no longer 1790, it is 1791. And note that Prince Hall is provincial grandmaster, not merely for Boston, but for all of North America. So let's summarize. England told Grimshaw that Prince Hall was never appointed a provincial grandmaster. Being told that such an appointment had never been made, Grimshaw revised and extended his forged patent and carefully corrected the errors identified by Sadler. He then published his, re his revised forgery in his book and compounded his egregious deception by claiming that he found the document in Pennsylvania. The fact that Grimshaw's patent is a forgery is of, is of some importance. Mm. Some of my brothers might not be on board with the consequences that follow logically from this revelation. Before I say it, let me say that there is no Mason known to me who is more worthy of the title and, no, and, and more worthy of the honor of serving as Grand Master as Prince Hall was. But the evidence shows that he could not have served as such. For Prince Hall to have served as Grand Master, there had to be a Grand Lodge. But African Lodge did not declare itself a Grand Lodge until after Prince Hall's death. There was no African Grand Lodge during Prince Hall's lifetime. And Grimshaw's claim that Prince Hall was a provincial Grand Master has been refuted by England and debunked by evidence from Grimshaw's own hand. But why would Grimshaw deceive us about such a thing? Was he just a malicious fraud? I think not. He hinted at his approach and explained his motivation when he pointed out the need for a publication supporting the legitimacy of Prince Hall Masonry. He apparently wanted to defend Prince Hall Masonry from its attackers. And it seems he would do so by any means necessary. Apparently, the defense he wanted to present demanded that Prince Hall be a Grand Master. But Grimshaw had no evidence that Prince Hall had been elected as such. So he allowed himself to create the evidence 
of an appointment. This depart departure from truth is a fatal flaw to his credibility as a historian. Anyone willing to create material and to invent testimony to support a false narrative cannot be trusted as a historian. And it gets worse. According to Alton Roundtree, Grimshaw ultimately created four more Grand Lodges for which there is no documentation. We are justified in rejecting anything he said that cannot be verified by independent sources. My position is that we can and we should omit such statements when we recite the Prince Hall story. Grimshaw's credibility as a historian has been soundly discredited for nearly half a century. Yet many of his false statements are repeated by Prince Hall Masons in September every year. Some of the writers and orators might not know they are quoting Grimshaw when they say that Prince Hall was born in Barbados, that he was a Methodist minister, that he was our first Grand Master. The sad part is that there is so much good information about Prince Hall, information that can be verified, that there is no need to embellish the story of our founder with falsehoods. It is not easy for researchers to determine that Grimshaw was the original source for, for various elements of our history. This is where the Prince Hall story revisited can be helpful identifying statements that careful historians agree are unsubstantiated. George Draffin, Charles Wesley, and Joseph Walks, three capable historians within three years of each other, identified numerous statements made by Grimshaw that have no supporting documentation. And these statements are all cataloged in the Prince Hall story revisited. Some of, the suspicious, some of the suspicious elements of our Prince Hall story are also discussed on the website of the Phylaxic Society. More of them are presented in the recent book by Alton Roundtree, Fact Checking William Grimshaw. It seems ironic, but if we are ever to rid ourselves of Grimshaw, we need to study his book. We must know what Grimshaw said so that we can avoid repeating those things that cannot be confirmed. We have to continue studying him and continue identifying statements that we know to be false. I close by reminding my brothers of something we tell Masons when they first come into the lodge. Truth is a divine attribute and the foundation of every virtue. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Williams. Um, that, that, was, that was great. Um, oh, no, you're okay. <laughs> um, no, that, that, that was pretty fascinating. And, you know, I think we, we, we hear a lot of things. I, you know, I know when I first came into the, to the craft, you know, some of the things you hit on as far as Prince Har being our, our, you know, first grandmaster born in Barbados and, and uh, it's a, a list of other things. And, you know, we hear these things and it, it, it's almost like it, it, it makes you feel a certain way, you know, like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I belong to an organization that, you know, this, this highly esteemed person, you know, um, helped found or, you know, which was, was, you know, one of our, um, our, our namesake, but I think you hit on something that's important that a lot of times I point out myself that like the what really happened and, and what we can prove is just as if not more impressive than the story that's uh, that was made up about his life, you know, so um, yeah, but it, it's just like I said, all these years we, we, we're still trying to, we're still dealing with a lot of these other things that we have to deal with, unfortunately. Can I add? Can I add one one thing? 
that may not be apparent from what I just said. Um, Prince Hall, in my opinion, was the greatest Prince Hall Mason to, to ever live. Uh, he just wasn't a grand master, and that is really of, of very little consequence. He was the person responsible for getting Prince for getting Prince Hall masonry chartered uh, under the Grand Lodge of England. You know, I think about this quite often. If I had been in uh, Prince Hall's position, I don't know if I would have had the the the, the wherewithal to get that charter from England. Yeah. Uh, he did something that, uh, in my opinion, was not an easy thing to do in his day and time. But he was he was a great man. But the fact that 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 he <clears throat> that he was not a grand master is really a very little consequence. He was the first worshipful master of African Lodge, and he was very proud of that. And uh, I'm very proud that uh, that that it was him who was in that position. True indeed. True indeed. Thank you for that, uh, good brother. Um, Brother Morgan, you also had a presentation as well that you want to make tonight. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, I do. Um, that's um, excellent job, Brother Williams, uh, as expected. Um, you know, uh, one of the things about being uh, the being a member of the, the jurisdiction of DC of of the District of Columbia, uh, and having served as uh, in the Grand Historians team and now serving as the, the Grand Historian. Um, you know, for those of you all who are not kind of in tune with the Prince Hall Masonic, you know, historical scene, you know, uh, DC, we do a lot of good stuff. But one thing that some of our folks do, and they want to try to bully me, Dave, <laughs> is, is, look, 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 y'all know I mess with Dave, I love Dave, y'all know that. Um, but one of the things that they do whenever they want to want to want to get some, get a shot in at DC is they always they bring up uh, Grimshaw and the fact that he was the past grandmaster uh, of the District of Columbia. Um, and so while I'm happy to say you know that he published a book and, and a lot of other jurisdictions can't say that about any of their grandmasters, um, you know it, it's a serious topic that we have to deal with, right? Um, the things that he wrote ha had ripple effects, and so I have a presentation where I want to talk about. Um, some of the reasons why I think that he may have, why he did what he did. Um, and I do plan on, um, I decided I'm actually going to probably write this up and publish it at some point in the near future. Uh, so I'm going to um, share my screen with you all. And uh, can everybody um, see, see the, uh, the slides? The, yep. The correct, do y'all see the notes or just the slides? I just see the, the first slide where it says Prince All Think Tank. Okay, very good, very good. I want to make sure y'all don't see the, the, the notes and all that. All right, so the title of this presentation is, um, is, is it still the same? Yep. All right, great. So the title of this presentation is um, William H. Grimshaw, Hero or Heretic? Okay. So just to give you some really brief background, past Grandmaster Grimshaw, he was born, as Brother William said, in the year 1848 in Westmoreland County, Virginia. His parents uh, were Julia Grimshaw and Robert Tyler, uh, so, they, so he says. Um, and I, I was able to get some of this information from a uh, website uh, on the Grimshaw family history, actually. And this is the family history of the white Grimshaws, but they included him in there as a prominent African-American who carried that surname um, as well. Um, while not much is known at this time about his youth, we do know that he actually served in the Civil War. Uh, he actually served in the United States Navy, which I'll talk touch on in, in, in one moment. Um, and as Brother Williams mentioned, in his private life, he served in, uh, he, he worked at the United States House of Representatives and at the Library of Congress. Uh, and, um, you know, as Brother Williams mentioned, Grimshaw worked as a, you know, working the coat, worked as a, uh, you know, checking coats and doing you know, as a doorman and whatnot, uh, which is, you know, not... Uh, not to belittle that profession, right? But one of the things that you that you will find here in D.C., especially at that time, is it was very common um, in many in D.C. and in many other cities, in fact, where you may have somebody who is a black man who works as a custodian of a bank. But when you ask him what does he do, he says, "Well, I'm in banking." You know, I'm the you know you may be the doorman at the White House, but you say, "Well, I work on uh, I work at the White House. Or I work in Capitol Hill." That's something that was very common in this area. In this area, and so I'm not surprised 
when uh when when Brother Williams revealed to us that the uh Brother Grimshaw uh was able to get a hold of some Library of Congress letterhead and write that letter to make himself look more official than he, than he perhaps was. In fact, had the people who were over him at that time known that he did that, he might have gotten in trouble, right? So so this these are some of the things that 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 happened, you know, during that period. So he was but he wasn't the only one. Uh here you see a copy of his certificate of discharge from the United States uh, Navy. Uh, as I said, he, he was in the Navy from 1863 to 1864, serving as a cabin steward. Uh, he served aboard the vessel known as the Wyandotte, if I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and there were several other uh, notable African-Americans from the D.C. area uh, who also served with him on this vessel, one of whom was actually Thornton A. Jackson uh, of the uh, Scottish, you know, famous Mason of the Scottish Rite uh, Southern Jurisdiction. Uh, who served as Sovereign Grand Commander, very prominent figure in Prince Hall Freemasonry here in D.C. They actually served in the Navy together. So uh, I was very fascinated to find that out. Um, now, through my work with the African American Civil War Museum here, uh, one of the things that I've been fascinated to learn about and I love telling people is that the, uh, the Navy was actually integrated during the Civil War uh, because of the specialized skill sets that sailors needed to have. So uh, if you ever come to D.C., right next to our Grand Lodge, uh, we have the African American Civil War Memorial, and across the street is the museum. Uh, on that, right behind the, the, the memorial statue, there are a number of silver plates that have the names of all the United States colored troops who served in the Civil War, with the exception of naval officers, because the Navy was integrated and they didn't keep uh, the, the the ethnic makeup on file of their um, of the servicemen at that time. Uh, here we actually have a photo. Um, of the Wyandotte. So that is, that is actually the vessel that past Grandmaster Grimshaw uh, served on out there in the harbor to your right. Uh, that's actually the, the, that vessel there. Um, in his private life, uh, he was married to Caroline Pryor Grimshaw and they had several children together. So you see them uh, depicted there. Uh, so, uh, you know, we have obviously the brother, you know, he had good taste in women. I'll say that. He had, had, he had good taste. Um, now again, Grimshaw gets a lot of flack in Masonic history because of his book, and I think, and I think he, rightly so. I think he, he deserves a lot of it. Um, but there were some other aspects to him as well in his Masonic life that, that don't always go um, noticed. Um, he was elected Most Worshipful Grand Master of the District of Columbia in the, for the year 1906, uh, and he actually fought and won uh, the legal battle um, against the John G. Jones. Uh, affiliated Grand Lodge that was fraudulently formed here in Washington, D.C. Um, a lot of folks, you know, don't don't remember that part. Uh, he actually uh, attended uh, and uh, the Masonic Congress of 1907, which was held in Norfolk, Virginia, which is actually very important because before the Prince Hall Grand Lodges established formally the Conference of Grand Masters of, uh, that we know today, they had Masonic Congresses that, and, and meetings that were informal organizational meetings. They didn't have a permanent organization with a president and other officers or anything, but they every so often would have these meetings where they would come together to uh, hash out any issues that they were having among the different jurisdictions uh, that, could, uh, that were descended from Prince Hall and African Lodge 459, okay? Um, also, uh, the... Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of D.C., like many other Grand Lodges, has gone through name changes. Uh, it was during the uh, tenure of past Grandmaster Grimshaw that we finally stripped the name York Wright, that designation, out of the names of our lodges. So at one time, um, we were known as the uh, Union Grand Lodge, uh, free and accepted ancient York Wright Masons, uh, and, and our lodges carried that F-A-A-Y-M title as well during the period when we were uh, named until Grimshaw stripped it. Um, and I think that this kind of leads us into some of the politics as to why Grimshaw wrote some of the inaccurate things that he wrote, okay? Um, I also wanted to just point your attention very quickly to this picture of him, which comes from our 1906 proceedings. And one of the reasons why I, I wanted to make sure I showed this picture is because very oftentimes in many books and whatnot, and even in our Grand Lodge, uh, we have a list, we have a, uh, a, a, um, a wall of all of our past Grand Masters. And the image that you'll see oftentimes of him, one of the images, you'll see this same picture from the neck up. And so I had never seen the full body picture until I found this uh, a few, couple of years ago. And I said, oh, my God, this is a, you know, regardless of what you think of Grandmaster, past Grandmaster Grimshaw's uh, writings, um, I just thought it was a really great picture. And so I wanted to kind of add a little, a fuller picture to the life of this man uh, here this evening. 
Um, now, we have to admit, as, as has already been stated, and will continue to be stated, the Grimshaw narrative is largely inconsistent with primary source documents of the various Prince Hall Grand Lodges, such as proceedings and other documents. Um, Grimshaw's history uh, is also inconsistent with the few published histories that pre-existed his work you know, in, in large aspect. And I wanted to kind of highlight this one as well uh, from, that doesn't always get talked about. Um, Dr. Harrison L. Harris uh, of the jurisdiction of Virginia, who uh, a year prior to Grimshaw's work uh, published his Masonic textbook, which does have some elements of Prince Hall Masonic history in it. Uh, he, you know, he kind of focuses, he starts off with a kind of broad narrative and kind of narrows it down to getting you to understand the history of the jurisdiction of Virginia up until that point. Um, a lot of times Grimshaw's work, I think because it was uh, marketed as the comprehensive history, it came out a year after H. L. Harris's, but oftentimes, in my from my experience, um, Harris doesn't always get the credit that I think he should as being a um, a writer of Prince Hall Masonic history just a year prior. So I wanted to make sure I included him in here uh, and shout out to all the brothers of Virginia because uh, th this was a man that um, whose name they should all uh, uh, be singing to the hilltops in my in my opinion. Okay. But as I said earlier, uh, you know, R Harris comes out with his in 1902. Grimshaw comes out with his in 1903, right? Um, this book did offer the most coherent narrative to that point of the history of African-American Freemasonry, right? So prior to this time, you had, you can go back and find newspaper clippings and other sources. We had the proceedings, right? We have the, 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 the um, primary source documentation, but up until that point, a lot of the information had not been compiled into a book. So when Grimshaw's book does come out and he's a grandmaster, he or he's about to be a grandmaster, he had been involved in Freemasonry for a number of years up until this point, right? Um, he was viewed as somebody who would have known and should have known the history. So it makes sense that this text would have been viewed as reliable. Unfortunately, we know that that is not the case, okay? Um, although this text was was seen as reliable and as a as a great source for the first roughly the first half of the 20th century uh, as brother williams stated earlier later scholars such as charles h wesley um joseph a walks and a number of others brother alton roundtree brother john hairston bay uh and and brother williams of course uh have you know since been able to uh, discredit much of the information that he wrote um there are several theories as to why his uh this book uh, contain so many errors, and I'm and I'm gonna uh, begin to wrap up in a moment. But I want to explain to you all some of the reasons why I think that this is the case uh, with with his work. So, as as, as everyone knows, uh, probably by now, uh, in uh, late 2018, I published uh, my my first book, The Lost Empire: Black Freemasonry in the Old West, from 1867 to 1906. Uh, you, if anyone's interested, you can get a copy from JamesRMorgan.com. Um, in researching and writing this book. I was researching and writing the history of the King Solomon Grand Lodge of Kansas, which was a subordinate Grand Lodge to the National Grand Lodge. And I, and I was also writing the history of William D. Matthews, who you see there uh, depicted on the cover. Right. Um, and something struck me as I was putting this book together. Um, I started to wonder why was it that I was finding all this great information that it seemed that none of my colleagues were aware of. I wasn't aware of. Right. And it came to it came to me over time that a lot of the reason why I was able to write this book that has all this information that people weren't aware of was because of Grimshaw. And I'm going to explain to you why. Um, the cause of the confusion was to me was part was partially politics and propaganda. OK, so here are three individuals that I think played a bigger role than we realize in why Grimshaw wrote his work, okay? Um, the first one uh, that you see there is Richard Howell Gleaves. Now, Gleaves is remembered in history as being the last um, kind of universally acknowledged national grandmaster, for lack of a better term, right? So uh, after Gleaves, you get into George Levere, you get into William Matthews, who you see here depicted, and that's where you start getting the whole split between the PHA, the uh, Prince Hall affiliation, Prince Hall origin. We've already done episodes on that, uh, so please make sure you go back and check the channel. Uh, to go back and refresh yourself on that information. But for our purposes here tonight, one of the things that strikes me about Grimshaw's work 
if, and if anyone has a copy of it, you know, a hard copy, or if you've been able to find a PDF of it somewhere, uh, one of the things I think oftentimes gets overlooked is that when you go in his book and you check out the foreword, the foreword, uh, I won't, won't read it to you all, but I'll summarize it. It states that this book has been checked and double checked and triple checked by the men who signed, who signed it and that they were some of those prominent Masons of African descent in the United States at this time. And that they were so knowledgeable that they had all the degrees between all of them. They, that they knew what was going on and that they verified what Grimshaw wrote was correct. And the names of those people, the first one that, you, that is there, uh, for those who don't have the book, the first one is R.H. Gleaves, past grandmaster, right? Which you, who you see his picture here. We also see Thornton A. Jackson, who I mentioned uh, earlier, right? John A. Gray, John W. Freeman. These are all brothers. And it actually says that they signed it, you know, the Masonic Temple, Washington, D.C., right? Now, let's focus on Gleaves, because that, that was something that really struck me. And I haven't really heard a lot of people talk about this. Um, Gleaves served as National Grandmaster during the period when everything starts to kind of fall apart for it, which I believe is, uh, was from 1865 to 1877, if I'm not mistaken. Now, many of the problems that you can find with the National Grand Lodge uh, in terms of when, it, when everything comes to a head happens under his tenure. But past Grandmaster Gleaves does a couple of things that are very interesting. One is that he ends up leaving the National Compact and becoming an independent Mason. Eventually, he, he, his membership bounced around a little bit, but eventually he settles in Washington, D.C. Uh, to live, and he brings his Masonic membership here and becomes it, the last lodge. He was a member of several lodges during his lifetime, but at the end of his life, he was a member of Eureka Lodge Number 5 here in the District of Columbia. He actually served as CCFC and a number of other positions here in, a, in the jurisdiction where I hold membership. Um, he lives a very long time. And he becomes you know, pretty close with Grimshaw and a number of others. Uh, and he's actually honored uh, at, towards the end of his life as being one of the most prominent Masons of, of African descent in the country. But the problem is, if you're writing a history of Freemasonry among colored people, and you're going to go back and you deal with that rough time period of 1865 to 1877, and even kind of going forward, and to some degree, maybe even going before that, Grimshaw, um, um, excuse me, Gleaves doesn't look that good. Oftentimes, for those who have read, or if you haven't read Grimshaw's book, I encourage you to, uh, to, when you do, to think about this. Oftentimes, the National Grand Lodge is portrayed as this monster, this evil, but there's no, but very rarely does Grimshaw want to name who were the people. It's almost like it was just this evil machine with no one at the head. I believe, I propose this evening that Gleaves may have, uh, through Grimshaw, been able to help save his reputation for posterity. And so today, and I, I remember Brother, Brother Alton Rountree uh, talked about this in his book on the National Grand Lodge, that today, oftentimes people don't, even myself, to be honest with you sometimes, um, oftentimes people don't think of Gleaves when they think of all the ills of the National Grand Lodge. And that may be because uh, we have this filter of Grimshaw in between us and that time period. Um, Moving on, uh, William D. Matthews, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I wrote a, a, a 492 page book um, on him and his Grand Lodge, the King Solomon Grand Lodge of Kansas. Grimshaw eviscerated the memory of William Matthews and the King Solomon Grand Lodge of Kansas from Prince Hall Masonic memory. Um, I, try, I did my best to try to put it back there. Whether, whether William Matthews and his Grand Lodge did the right things or the wrong things, my, my job was to try to present the facts. And a lot of the facts that I found were things that were out there, but a lot of my colleagues and myself, we, people were not aware of. Why? I believe it's because of Grimshaw. One of, to give you an example, um, and we talked about this on a previous episode, um, one of the things that he does is William Matthews establishes the King Solomon Grand Lodge of Kansas in June 24th of 1867. The Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Kansas that exists today, I will tell you, based on their proceedings, based on my research and the, the proceedings of that Grand Lodge, that the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Kansas was actually formed and constituted March of 18, 
76. However, if you go on their website today, if you go uh, into, uh, into most of the more modern sources today, the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Kansas will tell you that they were formed in 18, March of 1875. Why is that? The reason why that is is because one day before the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Kansas was, was to hold their meeting to constitute themselves, William Matthews incorporated his Grand Lodge to cement the fact in history that his Grand Lodge was first. And for many years, the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Kansas used the correct date of 1876 as their date. But Grimshaw, because he was anti the National Grand Lodge, he decided to backdate the, the Prince Hall Grand Lodge, which was independent of the National Compact. He, he backdated that Grand Lodge by an entire year to 1875 to try to make it seem to those of us who came after him that the King Solomon Grand Lodge had invaded Kansas. He, he, he writes almost as, as he writes a lot of these things in the book in his book. And therefore, now, whether or not you want to agree with the uh, Matthews group or with the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Kansas or whomever, that's not my point here today. My point here is today is let's get our historical chronology accurate. And then, you know, be, then I'll let you be the judge of what's right and what's wrong, et cetera, et cetera. That's for everybody to have their own opinion. Now, John G. Jones, uh, last but not least, uh, one of the things I think that's also important about, and this may be one of those things that, you, Brother Williams, I'd love to talk to you about uh, momentarily, is one of the things that I think Grimshaw did do that, you know, made, that had some good was I think that he gave PHA some historical identity because what he was doing was presenting us to the broader, i.e. the white Masonic world, for lack of a better term, and he was saying to those who did not know, we are a group of Grand Lodges that we descend from African Lodge 459. We are not the National Grand Lodge, or we no longer are the National Grand Lodge. We are not with William Matthews or Levere in, in their, their group, nor are we associated with John G. Jones in their form of irregular Freemasonry. We're not those clandestine Black Masons. We are the legitimate Grand Lodges of Black African American Masons. And so that's one of the things I think that was kind of good about it. But even if he went about it in, in a wrong way and, and in a historically inaccurate way, because there's many things that he wrote that we know are historically inaccurate. OK, so uh, lastly, I'm gonna, I want to give us some questions to consider. and I would love to uh, to, to talk to uh, the, uh, Brother Williams and the other panelists about these questions. Uh, my questions are, um, was Grimshaw trying to give African-American Freemasonry a usable historical narrative. Um, oftentimes in history, we talk about useful history, right? And I believe that he was. Whether or not the history was accurate, we uh, we already have discussed that. We know a lot of it was not. But um, I think he tried to give us a usable historical narrative. Um, was this usable past one that was meant to make us acceptable to the broader, i.e. the white Masonic world? As I already stated, I believe so. Um, and that may have had some good aspects, but there also were some bad aspects of it as well. I don't think, you know, the idea of trying to push a Prince Hall that was fictitious, one that was in no way uh, uh, related to slavery. He, was, he wasn't a slave. We, you know, he tried to make us acceptable. And personally, anyone who knows me knows I don't like respectability politics when it comes to black and white relations. We, we, we are who we are as a people, right? And we can talk about that momentarily. Um, question three. Was Grimshaw, and this is one of the ones that I'm very fascinated about, and I want to definitely want to hear Brother Williams' uh, response to this. Uh, was Grimshaw possibly recording oral history or repeating incorrect information that may have been passed on to him? Um, I do think that there's some evidence of that. I, I think that there's some things that he did intentionally, some things that he did maybe under the influence of Gleaves, but there are some things that, I that I've read in his book where I do kind of wonder did he receive false information from some of the Grand Lodges or did he get, and we all, you know, there's always a few brothers and sisters out there who pass on kind of Masonic old wives tales. I do kind of wonder, did that happen with certain things with Grimshaw? I can't prove it per se, but I, I do wonder. Uh, fourthly, was he trying to save the reputation of Richard Howe Glees while separating PHA uh, from the Masonic foes such as Matthews in the National Grand Lodge or John G. Jones and the clandestine groups. As I've already stated, I believe so, and I would love to hear uh, everyone's comments about that. Uh, and lastly, did Grimshaw's work help or hinder the study of African-American Masonic history? And that 
is for all of you to decide. So my final verdict on William Grimshaw's official history of Freemasonry among colored people is to please handle and read with caution. And with that being said, thank you all for your time and your attention. Uh, thank you, Brother Morgan. And I, actually, can you can you pull that? Can you pull your presentation back up? Sure. With, um, some of those questions, because I, I actually I, I do think that would be a good um, talking point to, to to at least cover some of them and get um, Brother Williams' um, views on some of those, as well as um, Brother Jackson and, and Brother Gill Arms as well, because um, you you do raise some excellent uh, some excellent questions. And also our, our viewers that are in the chat too, um, that are um, having a, a, a lively conversation uh, that looks like it's once again being led by our good sister, Sister Hackett, uh, in the in the in the uh, in in the uh, chat. So thank you, Sister Hackett, um, once again. So um, so Brother Williams. So I, I guess you know I'll I'll, I'll I'm trying to. I think I need to get another prescription with my glasses as far as it's small. I'm trying to read some of them, but I, I am interested. Thank you, good brother. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and I, I guess the, the the first one that, that, that James asked as far as, you know, was Grimshaw trying to give African-American Freemasonry a usable historical narrative? What, what's, what's your thought around that? And also some of the other panelists as well. So you're on mute. Okay, there you go. We can hear you now. I think it's, yeah, I think it's uh, very clear that uh, Grimshaw considered himself a defender of Prince Hall Masonry. Um, he makes that point, you know, up until his book, there was not, there was very little out there defending Prince Hall Masonry against the uh, people who were attacking it. So. Um, that was, uh, I think, uh, a major part of his motivation. He did produce an extremely, um, well, I, I can't say that it was authentic, but it, it was a massive and influential document. Um, <clears throat> I, I actually think that uh, br the brother Morgan is probably in a better position than I am to comment on some of the some of these things because That's I don't have uh, a lot of information about Grimshaw uh, the man or Grimshaw the the uh, the, the, the Grand Master. Um, I just have uh, his book. Uh, that's the the main source that I have uh, re regarding Grimshaw. I know very little else about his life, um, so I, you yeah. know, I'm I would I would take Brother Morgan's word for it since uh, he is Grimshaw's. Well, I'm not going to say defender <laughs> because he doesn't really have to defend Grimshaw. Um, nobody, nobody in 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 D.C. needs to defend Grimshaw. Uh, the fact that he was. Uh, elected as uh, one of your grandmasters. Um, at the time, you know, uh, Grimshaw was probably considered to be uh, a, a genius. Uh, the um, His errors, some people in, in, in Massachusetts were pointing out errors the very next year after his book was, uh, was released. But... Um, mm -hmm. As far as I can I can see, um, his final discrediting uh, came in the 1970s. Um, that's when the uh, the evidence of that uh, that patent that he created that's when that became uh, widely discussed. Uh, I'm sure it wasn't the first time it was discussed. Uh, it's 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 really the first time that I became aware of it, and. Um, that changed my thinking about Grimshaw uh, enormously. Mm. 
I mean, I, I, I really think it's, a, it's an interesting question because I guess the only, the only question that I would have to that question would be, and, and, and I'm only speaking from, I guess, from a, um, from an Ohio proceedings standpoint, I guess, when, when we look at uh, William T. Boyd and, and when he was CCFC and when he was Grandmaster and, and how um, Ohio had, had, um, entered into a lot of uh, mutual recognition agreements with a lot of Grand Lodges overseas. Now, and this predated this predated Grimshaw. So, you know, between because, you know, boy, at the same time, boy was fighting the, uh, the 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 compact. He was also trying to establish and not only, you know, a mutual recognition agreement overseas, but he was trying to form, um, you know, um, trying to come up with the mutual uh, agreements within Ohio and, and some other states as well, uh, some white grand lodges. So the the stories that the legitimacy that he had put together to prove our legitimacy, not only as obviously as a grand lodge, but in an extension, you know, and in, in our within our lineage to, you know, African Lodge and, and Prince Hall, all of that predated, um, predated Grimshaw. So I guess what I'm saying is that the historical narrative, while it wasn't as extensive um, and then going to as much detail as Grimshaw, it was it was still there. And I guess it was good enough for other Grand Lodges to recognize and say, hey, yeah, you know, you are a legitimate Grand Lodge. So I, I guess that's the the question that I would have to that question. You know, why, why did, did, did he either was he not aware of that and he still thought he needed to, to do something to jazz it up a little more or or I don't know. I don't know. You know, Brother Caffey, I, I look at um, when I look at the, the questions that that Brother Morgan posed in his uh, presentation was uh, was an outstanding presentation, um, by the way. But as I look at the, um, as I as I look at the the questions and Brother Morgan, it was something that you brought up um, concerning uh, Kansas and how the the date of their um, formation was uh, placed a, a year before, and it almost it kind of made sense for when I when I looked at uh, Grimshaw's book and look at looked at um the history that he put for for my jurisdiction because I, I know that when you uh bless me with the uh, copy of the book that's that's the first place I went to like I jumped to uh to North Carolina to see uh, what he put as far as North Carolina and you know uh looking at some of the the inconsistencies there because for the the history of of, of our jurisdiction you know we uh you know, were organized on March, March 1st, March 1st, 1870, um, and celebrating 150 years uh, this year. However, in his book, he has the date as January 15th, um, 1869. And he has the uh, the three lodges instead of the four um, that made up our uh, Grand Lodge to be chartered under the Grand Lodge of Ohio instead of being, you know, chartered under um under new york so you know there, you know of course uh, you know someone and, and it made me wonder like when you when you asked the question if you if we was trying to uh establish a uh, establish a narrative and have acceptance among you know amongst a, a broader scale and it made me look at the um the comment that uh brother eric konahina works for eric konahina made he said perhaps his reasons for doing it may have seen to him as legitimate at the time, but he never considered how his actions would affect our history as a whole today. And I think, you know, for him, it's like once you start to once you start to peel the onion and you see one inconsistency, how many others, you know, how many others are there? You know, uh, for example, in his um, when uh, Brother Caffey, you talk about um, being a CCFC where well, he has, you know, Grimshaw has in his book about James B. Dudley for our jurisdiction who served as CCFC for uh, 23 years, but he also has him as serving as a grandmaster, which he never did. 
um, and to the point where he talked about the first African-American Mason, and I hadn't had a chance to verify this yet, um, uh, the first African-American Mason in North Carolina being William H. Hancock, and that he was initiated, passed, and raised in St. James Lodge Number 3 in New Bern, North Carolina, which was <clears throat> under the Grand Lodge of North Carolina, ancient, free, and accepted. Now, looking at the history of William, William H. Hancock, um, first of all, there were two William Hancocks at that time in uh, New Bern, one black, one white. It wasn't until his adult years that William Hancock put the H in his middle, uh, used the H, uh, his middle initial of H in order to distinguish uh, who was who. Not only that, um, Grimshaw's book stated that he served as the Tyler in that lodge until his death. Well, according to, you know, history, um, Hancock didn't stay in New Bern all his life. You know, him being an architect, he moved from New Bern to New Haven, Connecticut, to uh, Chicago, and, and ultimately, I believe, down in Chicago. So the question that made that 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 you know puts on my mind, and I know it's something that it can't answer. Um, we know that you know we wanted to establish a historical narrative for for us as African American Masons, but it makes you wonder how far were you willing to go in order to have that narrative? Were you willing to put that stuff out? You know put stuff out there that you know um, wasn't necessarily true because as Brother Williams stated, this book was um, was published in 1907. So this book is being published on, you know, pretty much on average about 30 years after a lot of these Grand Lodges were formed. So why not be able to get, you know, certain information with proceedings and certain and things like that in order to put accurate information out um, you know, for us to have, because you can't say as a man, uh, yes, he did great things, but unfortunately this, what we talk about tonight overshadows everything, uh, everything that, that he's done. So that, you know, that's pretty much my take on, uh, Grimshaw at this point. Yeah, well, definitely an interesting point. Um, one of the things that I, I think is um, definitely needs to be discussed also is the fact that when we look at the Grimshaw's work, right, he didn't just deal with the lodges and the Grand Lodges. He also dealt with the appendant bodies, the Royal Arch, the Scottish Rite, the Shrine. Um, and, and to be honest with you, I mean, I don't know, you know, I mean, also, maybe, uh, maybe... I can't. I, I don't even know if, there, if I can give name a single book today that tr that tried to be as comprehensive as as his was for for Prince Hall for Masonry. I mean, maybe uh, you know. I mean, he he tried to do so much that, and I think that he was trying to service an audience that was hungry for that information, um, while at the same time trying to knock out some of these political opponents that I mentioned earlier. So for me, you know, w when I you know. Um, and sitting down with folks, and, and they really, and if if you seriously want to learn about Prince Hall Masonic history from James Morgan, when I, when I, when this when the topic of Grimshaw's book comes up, I often put it into the category of propaganda. Um, I think that he was really a propagandist for what we today know as PHA Freemasonry. And while uh, he may have been quote unquote on our side as far as you know some of those politics are concerned, um, I think that the way he went about it, as has already been stated, r did a lot of damage to his credibility. There are things that he wrote that, you know, that were correct. Um, but there's a lot of stuff in there that, you know, as I said earlier, if, if you get a hold of his book and you decide to go into to reading it, handle with care, go get some other sources, some primary sources, go get some of the more recent books um, on the topic. Um, because uh, there's, there's so much in there that's wrong. And that's why I wanted to make sure I presented on why why i think that he why he he did that cuz you know if you read some 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 people like um like wesley or or or, or brother walks and, and brother williams please feel free to to um to let me know your thoughts on this i think that there was definitely a, a intellectual response to grimshaw but i also think there was somewhat of an emotional response too by people like brother walks because for so long people had been saying these things that grimshaw had you know that were rooted in grimshaw's work and then when they realized that they were wrong there's like this visceral response against him 
not just as a historian, but also personally, right? But then the other aspect of it is, it's like, okay, let's throw the whole thing away. Well, no, we got to deal with it. We got, like you said, in order to get rid of it, we got to read it. We've got to know it so that we can correct the uh, the historical narrative across all the different branches of Freemasonry. You you mentioned a an emotional response, um, <clears throat> brother Walks definitely had an, an emotional response to Grimshaw. Um, brother Walks actually went to Barbados. Um, he actually had another mission because he has family. Uh, his family originally, he has family members who uh, came out of uh, uh, Barbados. So he was over there doing uh, genealogical research on his family, but you've, you've got to believe that he, when he was looking for his family members, he was definitely looking for the name Prince Hall. And Brother Walks, had a very visceral reaction uh, to Grimshaw. Um, he did a presentation. We have a videotape. Well, when I say we, the Philaxic Society has a videotape of a presentation that he made where he talks about uh, Grimshaw. And um, I thought I had a clip of that. I, I haven't been able to find, find it recently, but I do have a transcription of it uh, where he talks about Grimshaw in very emotional terms. Uh, he was very disappointed uh, having gone to uh, Barbados looking for uh, information regarding Prince Hall's birth and mm -hmm. not finding anything there. Uh, yes, it was a very emotional thing. At least hey, for Brother, uh, Williams. Brother Walks. Brother Williams. Brother Williams, I'm, I'm wondering too, with 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 how and you would know, because um, you 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 knew Brother Walks personally. Um, what was part of that too? I mean, was it a worry that you know that the discovery that um, what Grimshaw had written, many of the things were not true. Was it also a fear that you know, oh, you know, oh my God. This is going to bring into question the the legitimacy once again of Prince R Freemasonry. Do, do, do you think that that led to some of that as well? Um, I, I I don't I don't think so. Um, some of the things that Grimshaw was actually worried about um, were were not as damaging as he might have thought they were. Um, but by the time, <clears throat> by the, um, <clears throat> by, by the time the 20th century rolled by, um, I think there was very good, uh, authority to, uh, to demonstrate the regularity of Prasal Mary. Uh, Grand Lodge of England says, well, you know, it, it, it was some little difficulties there, but, um, Based on how we operate now, we are as regular as any other Grand Lodge ever established. Uh, there were some unusual things in the formation of um, Prince Hall Masonry, but um, I don't believe that there's anything there that would uh, that could invalidate us. I I don't worry about it myself, and I don't think uh, Joe Walks did. Joe Walks was another person who vigorously defended the regularity of Prince Hall Masonry, and I don't think he would have uh, allowed anything that Grimshaw said to uh, to interfere with his defense of the order. Thank you, Brother Gillarm. You had something? Uh, yes, sir. Um, uh, when I started looking at um, at, at Grimshaw's book, and um, those, uh, I think I bought his book years ago, and uh, started researching some stuff, or looking at what he said about Georgia, and then comparing it to actual research, I saw that some of the things they said were completely incorrect. Uh, there were some things that were correct, 
and there were some things that he would get you in the ballpark on. Uh, so I started looking at other Grand Lodges too, like Connecticut. Uh, so for example, uh, Grimshaw on Grimshaw's account, he says that uh, January 7th, 1874, a convention of the craft was held in the city of Hartford for the purpose of organizing the Grand Lodge of Masons for the state, which was consummated by the election of Right Worshipful Brother William H. Lang Jr., Most Worshipful Grand Master. So that's what Grimshaw wrote in his book. But Connecticut's proceedings actually show that a convention was held in the city of New Haven on November 3rd, 1873. The lodges that called the convention formed themselves into a Grand Lodge on that day as well. But William H. Lane Jr. was elected Grand Master. So when I started to look even further, uh, there was a meeting on January 7th, 1874 in Hartford, Connecticut. And that was when the Grand Lodge had their first session and it appears that the, the officers were elected that time as well. So uh, if you completely disregard what Grimshaw uh, uh, writes or what he wrote, you're going to miss a lot of the story, in my opinion. I just say once you get it, once you get his book, um, as, uh, as everybody has already stated, you have to fact check everything. Uh, and some of the stuff that Grimshaw wrote will get will get you in the ballpark of uh, actual of factual research. So just because it's Grimshaw, don't automatically throw it. In my opinion, don't don't automatically throw it out. Take it uh, when he writes on something. Just I'm glad check. you said that, brother Gillarm, because um, I have my copy right here, and I see on one of these pages that he says that he was actually a Knicks fan. <laughs> that would be a good thing. Oh. That would be a great thing. <laughs> Since Grimshaw is now is, is a big fan, uh, everything you okay. said is true. That would explain why there was a part in here where he talked about hey. winning the championship. That would All right, look, look. On, on that note, let's go to some <laughs> audience questions. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, yeah, we've got we got a lot of great uh, audience questions. We want, and again, thank you to everybody uh, in in the, the chat because we, we cannot uh, do it without uh, you all for sure. Um, actually, you got almost almost got too many. Um, so, uh, Mark Thomas wants to know what must we do as Masons to dispel the continued acceptance of the lies that Grimshaw, I uh, guess, told on, on, in our brotherhood. research. Uh, don't take everything at face value, no matter if it was Grimshaw that said it, uh, if it was uh, uh, Brother Walsh that said it, if it was Dave Gillam that said it. Fact check every single thing. Uh, that will help dispel these rumors. That's, that's my two cents on it. I have, um, <clears throat> I have an opinion on that also. Um, we have some some grand lodges that I would really like to hear from. Uh, grand Lodge of Massachusetts, uh, grand, Lodge, grand Lodge of Pennsylvania. They have, I think, the ability to um, solidify our history, <clears throat> uh, especially uh, the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts. Um, I, I, I wish we could hear from them. Um, how can they reconcile <clears throat> the history that they have written with the um, misstatements made by, by Grimshaw? Anyway, um, I, I'm hoping that maybe that can happen someday. And... Um, if it does, then um, more of our Prince Hall Masons can get on board. Um, we can only hope. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. And I think even on a grassroots level, um, you know, we need to, like when, we, when we're having Prince Hall days, you know, um, or when we're doing things that definitely in the public, and, and, and we're telling some of our stories, uh, as Dave said, you know, fact check a lot of that stuff or, you know, start, start. If, if you're looking at this show or you're, you know, you're a novice researcher or whatever, 
volunteer to tell the story. Um, and, but make sure that you're, you've researched the story before you tell it. Um, but I, I know I, I've been present at some Prince Hall days before where, you know, the, the, the story that's given around, uh, around Prince Hall is, is you can tell that it's based on what Grimshaw has written. So I, I think, um, you know, definitely as Grand Lodges, we can deal with a, a, a lot of it, should deal with a lot of it on that level. But I think on a, on a large level, too, when we're having these events, making sure that we're uh, telling the correct story as well. Yeah. Uh, great yeah. question. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with, with everything that's been said. And, you know, again, I think, um, you know, it's important that we that if you have the correct information that it be told that it be written down published like you know in the phylaxis or other publications get your book out there right get your documentary do do an interview that old past master or past matron or what have you to get it on the record um we have this idea that you know and i'm gonna i'm just gonna flat out say it there's an idea among some of us that um that there's kind of like this anti-writing Kind of thing that goes on sometimes, and I get it. Everybody's not a trained writer and all this type of stuff. But if you have the correct information, it's on you to make sure it's on the record in some way, shape, or form. Because um, if not, you may have somebody like a Grimshaw or whomever that comes along and writes something that's out there. And now, once it's out there, I mean, I was surprised to find um, people like John Hope Franklin, uh, for those who know uh, the great scholar historian John Hope Franklin, Dr. John Henry Clark. Um, anyone who's familiar with him and his work, I'm surprised. I was very surprised to find them quoting Grimshaw, but neither one of those men were Prince Hall Mason. So it's our job as men, Masons and Eastern stars to tell our story. We can't wait on outsiders. We can't wait on scholars who are not affiliated with us as, as members. We have to tell our own story in order for it to be done correctly. Because other than that, we're going to be sitting here for the next hundred years wondering about Grimshaw or, or other erroneous work. Um, but I believe it's a. But I believe it's a. It's, it becomes a double edged sword because. Yes, I. Yes, I. And I agree with you. I believe that that those who have the truth should uh, put it out there in in some form or fashion. But as we're, you know, when you look at tonight and we're dissect dissecting the work. Um, I know when we look at when you were in, in some of these uh, Facebook groups and Brother Morgan, Brother Gillam, you can attest to this. Whenever somebody puts something out there, the first question that we ask is, where is it written? And so because of, you know, because of that, and we're looking at, you know, something that's been written and something that's uh, something that's been, you know, been put out there. A lot of times we have a tendency to look at what's been written as being as being the gospel, you know, so now it, it it becomes to a thing, it comes to a point where, okay, yes, this has been, yes, this has been written, yes, this has been, uh, this has been put out there. You had, you know, look at, you you pointed out in Grimshaw's book where he had some very prominent Masons, you know, back his book by writing, you know, writing something and writing their, their name in it. <clears throat> so now, you're going to have certain people who, you know, certain brothers, you know, prominent brothers who may uh, have an issue putting their name on something because, you know, how accurate is this? How accurate is this information? What are you what are you putting? Your, what are you putting out there? What am I putting my you know, what am I putting my name on? So, you know, sometimes it's a double edged sword because while, yes, I, you know, it, it should be, you know, should be written at the same time. How much of it is, you know, is um going to be uh going to be believed because the question is going to be okay you know is it true but what is truth to you you know so it's a unfortunately it's a it's a double-edged sword it shouldn't stop you from writing it because it should be out there our history you know should be out there because we're losing a lot of our history because it's not written but that double-edged sword is still there absolutely um we have another question this i think this one's gonna, it's gonna be a good one Coming from uh, from Patrick Reiner, who asks, uh, "Why does it seem that telling a quote truer story of Prince Hall is avoided or frowned upon by the masses?" Because people are afraid, are afraid of change. That's the yeah. that's the that's the best. You know, when you you know the 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 biggest word that that comes to mind is tradition. 
at the end of the day, what you know, what's being told is is being tradition is tradition, and tradition is not you know just because it's tradition, it doesn't make it right, you know. Um, and we know that we have to make what's right the tradition, um, but you know, of course, we also know people don't like change, you know, and it's going to be it's going to come to a point where you either change. Uh, or you, you know, or you're going to be changed. You know, you look at the the situation um, with uh, Brother John Hairston in his book, you know, um, and how we're, you know, we're still, you know, uh, you know, dealing with that. So basically, um, you know, at, at the end of the day, we have to basically take off that Band-Aid and, and, and make that, you know, make that change and, and put out there what's true and what's factual and stop dealing with tradition and stop dealing with what sounds good. Uh, I think another issue with that, I think it was an article. Uh, I could be mistaken on this. I thought it was an article in the Flax is called titled Prince Hall the Christ. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so when you start talking about like, and this is, I'm putting my finger at myself too. You have a lot of us, a lot of Prince Hall Masons that have made Prince Hall to actually be the Christ. So when you start, start telling the truth about Prince Hall, which changes what's already been out there, now it seems like you're attacking him. And now you're attacking Prince Hall Masonry. Um, so just like, for example, saying that Prince Hall was never a grandmaster, some of us will get really offended by that because we have made Prince Hall to be so high that he has to be the grandmaster of grandmasters. He has to be everything. Uh, and he's equivalent to Christ. Uh, so we have, so that's probably why you get so much blowback as well because we put uh, Prince Hall on so high of a pedestal at which false narratives that when we start telling the truth, it, it seems like it's coming across as a personal attack against Prince Hall. Uh, one other thing too, I think that's important is truth and history can be politically inconvenient. Okay. When you talk about some of these topics that we're dealing with, with Grimshaw, whether it co whether it's the history of the national grand lodge, um, which again, in my viewpoint, um, was really minimized and, and Grimshaw did his best job he could to try to erase the importance of that topic from our history, right? Um, when you look at the actions of some of the grandmasters, like I, like I said, with, with, with uh, past grandmaster Richard, Richard H. Gleaves, you know, he, to me, uh, he wasn't the angel that he's portrayed as in, in the book, you know, not to say he was a bad person, but you know, um, Things can be politically inconvenient. You know, if you have a Grand Lodge that has been using incorrect dates, and, and we've, we've stated, you know, this evening, I mentioned Kansas, you know, uh, Brother Jack alluded to uh, uh, Brother Harrison's book on, on the history of African Lodge. and whatnot. Those are not the only states that have used incorrect dates. We, those are just two examples. You know, um, there was a time period, and um, every now and again, when I talk to uh, the good brother, uh, Ralph McNeil, he, might, he always likes to bring up the fact that for years here in D.C., we were saying, I, I, I'm pretty sure based on Grimshaw, that Social Lodge Number 1 was the first lodge for black men south of the Mason-Dixon line, which is incorrect, okay? Um, it was the first lodge in D.C., but it was not the first lodge south of the Mason-Dixon line, you know? I mean, th those things can be inconvenient, and when we have belief in something, that belief can be so strong that even though someone comes to us with some correct information and this that, and that third, it's inconvenient and it's uncomfortable. Yeah, and, and I also think too with, with, with a lot of these things that like the research, the the research has been done to 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 bring forth the truth, but um, I guess and, and and I'm going back to something um, that we had talked about before, where like you know. You can have the greatest information in the world, but you, what's the process in getting it out? You know, because even if you publish a book or if you publish a paper and saying, OK, we're going to correct the record. This this is the new, you know, it. Well, if you're dealing with something that's been in 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 in, in the fraternity for a number of years, you have to be strategic with how you're going to get that information out as as well. You know, how how, how do we. You know, we have the correct information now. Now the next step is what steps are we going to take in order to get the information out? 
you know, and really coming up with a comprehensive plan um, to do that. You know, we, 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 we've seen that with, with, um, with uh, Grimshaw and, and, and the, the information, I mean, the, 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 the Philatelic Society has done a great job um, and, and individual brothers have done a great job in researching and getting the correct information. Um, but it, it, I think it's been slow in getting out to, to, to folks because not everyone, the, the, the majority of the members of the craft aren't researchers. You know, uh, a lot of folks don't, don't pick up books and, and, and read, you know, um, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but just, you know, they don't research things as, as much. So what's our plan to address that? Because we, we've seen it with this and now we're seeing it with the whole 1775 versus 1778, you know, thing. And I think that's that's being approached a little differently based on what happened with Grimshaw. Like, you know, what there needs to be a strategic plan in order to get that correct information out there for the record. Absolutely, absolutely, uh, brother William. Do you have anything to add? Not on this topic. Oh, okay, no problem at all. All right, uh, we're going to go on to we we got a lot lot of questions. So I apologize, we won't be able to get to everybody th this evening, but uh, but we will try our best. Um, one question that came. Let me see here. Uh, shout out to Past Master Mujahid Bay from Joppa Lodge Number Fifty Five. I'm an honorary member there, so I had to make sure. I, he said, "Peace to the brothers, showing and proving our history." Thank you for sharing. So definitely want to uh, shout out the good brothers of Joppa Five Five. Definitely want to appreciate that. Uh, Sister Christine Hackett. Uh, she asked, "Is it safe to trust everything that is printed in proceedings? Some of the Grand Lodges and Grand Chapters' histories are mere compilations of memories." coming from untrained brothers and sisters. Anyone want to take that? I'm not going to touch that one. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Uh, well, well, I'll, 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 I'll dip, dip, dip in that pool real quickly and just say that, um, you know, as we know, proceedings are supposed to basically be, basically be primary source documents. Um, and so, um, if they're if they are inaccurate or if there are inaccuracies, then of course we have to call those into question. But they are supposed to be um, on the closest thing you're going to get, you know, because especially the further back you go, nobody was recording. You know, they didn't have video cameras and things of that nature. So they're supposed to be the closest thing you have to actually be in there, um, you know. Yeah. And, and it's interesting, too. And I always say this, like, it's just it's interesting to look at proceedings and look at the the evolution of how they're written you know because mm -hmm. i i think at least the proceedings i've 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 come across like the, the proceedings you know mid to late 1800s versus say proceedings today the the the, the proceedings from the mid the mid to late 1800s they really painted a picture of what like if at least for me i can read some of those and i almost feel like i'm in the session you know because depending on the grand secretary and who's typing it up and who's writing it up or, or wrote it up. They really paint a good picture of what's going on and different things versus now, you know, some of our proceedings, they're just like, you know, just regular minutes, you know, which they're supposed to be minutes, but they're not as descriptive as, um, right. you know, the older ones are. Right. Right. And I'm sorry, go ahead, Dave. Um, I think with everything you got to fact check because, um, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head what it was from uh, different Georgia, Georgia proceedings. Um, uh, one of our past grandmasters had put something out regarding, I believe it was our history, uh, and it was it, it was incorrect. But then the following year, he went back and 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 and, um, and stated that what he said was incorrect. So, uh, but if you didn't have that year, all you would look at is the incorrect information, and then you would, you would run with it. So I think it's important to to verify everything. Um, uh, one person that I, I I can't stand in Ohio history is Gleaves. No, no, that Gleaves Boyd. Uh, Boyd put out a lot of bad stuff about Georgia. <laughs> uh, so, but if you didn't have Georgia proceedings to fact check it, you would take yeah. what Boyd said and just run with it. So yeah, yeah. I think it's I would I would say it's say. I think with anything, just fact check it. That's what I gotta say. Right, right. 
Can I can I add one thing? Um, personal experience. Is it safe to trust everything printed in proceedings? No. Um, I I want to re- uh, talk about a personal experience that I had in one of our national bodies. It was not my Grand Lodge. I want to go ahead and 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 put that out there. But um, in one of uh, one of our meetings, I made a motion that was recorded by the recording secretary. And in the reading of the minutes, that motion was read. The next day in a recap, uh, th- that, mi- that motion that I made was omitted. And it was important because what I had asked the body to do was a very, very critical thing which they did not do, and they omitted, they just took the, the motion out of the minutes. So um, things can happen. You know, like uh, I, I, we have, we, we've got things happening in our nation right now that we, we can't trust everything that's coming out of our national leaders. And we cannot always trust what comes out of our Masonic groups. Um, no, it's not safe to trust everything printed uh, in, in, in proceedings. In, in a lot of cases, that is the best information we have. We are supposed to be able to trust it. We want to be able to trust it, but we have to depend on the people that we put in charge to keep these things, to, to keep it honest. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and and lastly, on that point too, that's that's a great point, um, Brother Williams. And I think it's incumbent upon, especially the Grand Lodge historians, that during Grand Lodge proceedings or or Grand Lodge sessions or whatever, to really point out <laughs> to the Grand Secretary and to those that are present the importance of correctly documenting everything, because um, if when people are researching what went on down the road years and years from now when we're not here it needs to be like you said it needs to be a correct accounting for of, of what took place absolutely absolutely um there's a question here that's actually aimed at me and um i'm not sure who who, who this brother or sister is here but um do they say past morgan that's me uh how does your rational rationale explain Past grandmasters disregard for our tenet of truth, the objective of Masonic study. No disrespect intended. You know I love and respect you greatly. Well, I love and respect you too. I appreciate you. I'm not sure who's using it, it is, but thank you so much for that. <laughs> um, you know, if I'm understanding the question correctly, I think he's asking why did Grimshaw um, disregard truth in, in the writing of his book? Um, I don't. I can't get into the man's head, but what I can say is, as I said earlier, I think that there was, I think that there were some political motives um, to the writing and the construction of this particular work that we've, what we've been discussing tonight. And I think that you can't, um, that, that's the only explanation that I can come up with. If I were Grimshaw and I was doing this work, why would I do that? You know why would I? You know that's that's really the only explanation I come up with was that there were political motives, and that's one of the reasons why I think a lot of people have been perplexed um, by Grimshaw's book. As far as you know, I mean, my first introduction to Grimshaw, I think, came through Charles Wesley, and one of the things that Wesley pointed out was he said that, uh, if I'm if I recall correctly, he basically said that a lot of this stuff came from Grimshaw's imagination and just stuff that he just made up and whatnot, and uh, and. That kind of bothered me because I I don't think there are sometimes where people just do things, but but to write a whole book, I mean, I felt that there had to be more to it than just he was just some crazy guy with too much time on his hands and he was greedy and just wanted to get get paid. Um, I, I think that, that there was that there was more to that, and like I said earlier, the more that I dug in my own project, I didn't start out really thinking about Grimshaw at first, but the more I dug into the process of writing my own book and starting finding all these facts. I'm saying, well, wait, how did I find all this? But no one else seems to know Grimshaw. It, it kept coming back to Grimshaw, Grimshaw, Grimshaw. He, he had uh, some political motives that he, for himself, 
I think for the independent or the PHA Grand Lodges, which we all here to, are, are members of, um, as well as, as I said earlier, I think that there was, I definitely think that there was a, um, an untold story to the fact of Gleaves. I mean, think about just, let, let's just step back for a second, right? We've all done things that we're embarrassed about, or, you know, we would rather not remember, or we, we, we regret. Well, what if you live long enough that you're the only person around, or you're one of the few people around that remembers back when you were in college or in high school, and that time that, you know, by the time you tell a story, let's be honest, right? By the time you tell a story, there was, it's, instead of that one fight you had in, in your sophomore year with that one person, you know, it, it was 10 guys <laughs> or 10 girls and you whooped everybody, right? I mean, that's what I think happened with Gleaves. I think that Gleaves, you know, and Grimshaw very strategically made sure that Gleaves' reputation for history was, would remain intact. And, and so for me, as much as I talk about Grimshaw, I always throw that Gleaves part in there because I really think that that really, for, at least for me, that helps me sleep at night on this question. Uh, you all may disagree. I don't know if I don't. What, what do you all think about what I'm saying on that? Do, do y'all y'all think I, I'm on to something or to 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 an extent? Um, and my reason for saying that is because um, just recently looking at the book the way I did. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, like I said, you know, you have um, those prominent names, you know, uh, who are uh, in the book who basically, you know backed up, you know, uh, backed up what he said. I think my only, I think if he was like trying to um, preserve the reputation of um, Gleaves, uh, my my only, um, I think my only drawback on, on the comment is looking at, you know, how he um, described North Carolina's history. And, and, uh, and, and uh, my reason for saying that is because you know, the lodges were formed under Gleaves leadership. You know, Gleaves was a national grandmaster um, when um, Paul Drayton and uh, past grandmaster um, Hood were, you know, forming the lodges down here um, in, in North Carolina. And it was under the permission of, you know, Gleaves. So, you know, I would I would personally think that if you're, you know, trying to, um, you know, keep his reputation um, you know, you know, intact, you know, um, you would basically give him that credit, you know what I'm saying? And, and maybe that's, you know, maybe that's the reason that he put, you know, that the, the lodges were chartered under the Grand Lodge of Ohio, being that Glee was from Ohio, not, you know what I'm saying? I'm not sure, but, um, I mean, that could be the case, you know, like you, but like you said, you know, we may never know. So. And I think partially uh, Grimshaw, this is just my personal opinion, that Grimshaw may have been, may have been trying to revive Prince Hall himself. Because if you look at it, Prince Hall died in 1807. And many of us go to uh, Cops Hill and we take pictures at the broke, you know, with the broken column. But I don't think a lot of people may, may not realize that broken column was not erected until 88 years after Prince Hall's death. Uh, which was just eight years, if I'm my math right, eight years uh, prior to Grimshaw's book. So uh, with that incident happening, that may have, it may have been trying to like just just uh, bring him back to life because people may have just forgotten about it. Yeah, yeah, I think that, that that's also an element as well. Um, this idea of, like you said, trying to resurrect the image of Prince Hall. And that's why, why I said earlier about a usable history, right? Is we have a past. But what is it doing for us? You know, give, you know, the, even the idea that we're saying Prince Hall Freemasonry today, I think is rooted in that conversation that you're having, Dave. I think that that's, that's very important. Uh, we're going to get ready to wrap up here. We do have, a, we have, we're going to have time, I think, for two more questions, Brother Caffey. Okay, so. Yes, sir. Before, yep. you get in that next, before you get in the next question, James, I, I, I just want to say something that, that Brother Konohina put up, and, it, and I think it ties into what we're talking about tonight. You know what he said when he asked about those who endorsed the book, and he said, "Did they really endorse? Did he? Did they endorse the book, or did he plagiarize the endorsement too? Everything is in question, and that go and that you know it lets you know that once you you pretty much open up Pandora's box because once you find one thing that's inconsistent, it makes you question everything else. How much you know? What else is you know? How much else you know? Inconsistencies do you you know, do you really have? And it makes you peel, peel back that onion. So I thought that was a good uh, comment as well. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Um, there's a question here from Penny Lovett Brown asking, would it be would it have been that during that t- that t- the time Grimshaw wrote his book in that period many could not read and mouth to ear was utilized? Do you think that he banked on that? On literacy? Um I don't think I don't think so. I, I think that um you know Grimshaw came up at a period, you know, you have to recognize that the, the African American community went to almost a ninety percent or almost almost a hundred percent literacy rate within a generation after the Civil War. So literacy, you know, was important. That's why he wrote the book was because you had more people, particularly black people who were literate, who were reading and, and wanted to read about things about about themselves. Uh, that's, that's my thoughts. I don't know if anyone else has anything to add on that. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm going along those lines, too. Um, and just thinking about my own Grand Lodge, you know, we're talking about our first Grand Master was a former slave. Uh, we had many members of our Grand Lodge that were slaves um, and they could read and write. Um, and from the time that our Grand Lodge formed, there was a ritual. And even in, I think, 1885, uh, the Grand Master, um, uh, maybe not, maybe 1883, uh, the Grand Master had talked about, uh, had an issue with brothers reading the ritual versus uh, memorizing it. So I don't know if really the literacy part really, uh, or illiteracy part played a factor. Okay. And But I, I do, hold on, I, I'm ahead. sorry. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, but, but I... <laughs> I don't think it may not have played a part during that time, but I think since then, those stories have gone mouth to ear and that's how it's taken off because um, the majority of folks that are um, us, Prince Hall Masons, that have passed these stories, a lot of us haven't even, you know, may not have even read the book, but we've heard it, you know, repeated on on, on a variety of, um, you know, through a variety of means. So I, I, I think that's what, perpetuated it mm-hmm. so this next and last question i think i'm gonna i want to ask uh brother williams to take on first uh th- now this one comes from byron upton who wants to know how do we hold our leadership accountable for this and by this uh, i believe he's saying how do we hold our our masonic leaders accountable for the inaccurate histories that some of us have on our websites some of these books that have been put out there, pamphlets, et cetera. What, what can we do in the here and now, Brother Williams, to try to correct the historical narrative of Prince Hall Masonry in our different jurisdictions, as well as nationally, internationally, et cetera? How, how, what, what can we all be doing? I, 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 I don't believe that um, our leaders are responsible for, for what's happening. Uh, we have a handful of people who can resolve this. And um, I'll go back to what I said earlier. It is almost mandatory that Massachusetts speak out because the Conference of Grand Masters is never going to accept anything other than the party line until Massachusetts comes forward with what they accept as the true history of African Grand Lodge. Uh, I don't think anyone else uh, can do it. I don't, hold, I don't hold the leaders at my Grand Lodge responsible for the history that we have. Um, I don't hold anyone responsible for believing what Grimshaw wrote <clears throat> because that, that uh, uh, that's going to be a problem until we get something from um, from Massachusetts. I, I I honestly believe that's the only way that it can happen. We are not going to get the the Conference of Grand Masters is not going to go along with any history that the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts does not endorse. So we need to get something from Massachusetts clearing up these inconsistencies. And maybe then the, uh, the Conference of Grand Masters will, will get on board and grand historians 
will be released from the party line and can go ahead and dig into uh, what they see as uh, consistent uh, with, uh, with the evidence. There is an objective truth out there that we, 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 that there has to be. We just, we don't know what it is and we are be, being prevented from digging it out because we're stuck with the party line. We, we have to get released from this commitment to the party line and then the uh, grand historians can go ahead and, and, and do the job that they want to do. I believe that there are people uh, in Massachusetts and in Pennsylvania who want to tell the story, uh, but they've got to be released from the party line in order to do it. Absolutely. Uh, one one other thing I would add, I would add to piggyback on that, Brother Williams, is um, I think that uh, also, as was mentioned earlier, um, if you're not a member of the Philaxis Society or the Phyllis Auxiliary, um, I would highly encourage you to do that as well um, and to submit uh, your own original research and articles and uh, and whatnot. Uh, there's a number of other ways to do that. Um, I do I do hear what you're saying, Brother Williams, regarding you know uh, the state of Massachusetts when it comes to that early kind of history and, and every Grand Lodge it, you know, kind of is responsible for maintaining their own history, right? But I also think that we as individual members uh, we can do our parts to correct things and to say, hey, I found something new or something that we, you know, a lot of these Grand Lodges are old and have forgotten more than other organizations have ever known as far as their own history goes. So uh, I also would encourage people to, you know, don't and don't feel that you're too new or too inexperienced or what have you. I, I would highly encourage people to be submitting articles, whether it's on history or anything else, to the Philaxis Society, to your local jurisdictions, uh, to, to, if you have a, a newspaper or a newsletter or something. Um, to a his local historical societies and, and also get involved with those as well as local historical and genealogy societies that may have some information uh, that can help you out as well to kind of piece together the narrative of your grand lodge, your grand chapter, and also the people who, who were leaders of it in the past. Um, you, you can do a lot of this stuff right from home, believe it or not. So, so definitely. Yep. All right. Thank you, brother uh, Morgan. So um, before we close out, uh, Brother Williams, uh, can you tell us uh, about just, a, um, you know, again, because it was mentioned several times during the uh, broadcast tonight. And, um, you know, obviously you played a huge role in that. Tell us about the importance of the Philaxis Society. And, and if we have any of our viewers out there that wanted to join or would like to join, how could they do that? The uh, Philaxic Society, we think, is the third largest uh, Masonic research society uh, in the Masonic world. Uh, the first is, of course, the, um, the lodge that I, uh, I mentioned earlier, Kuwaito Coronati, number 2076. And the second largest is here in the United States, the Philalethe Society. And uh, the Philaxic Society, which is which was organized by Prince All Masons for Prince All Masons, but it's open up to uh, the world, is the third largest research society, uh, Masonic research society um, uh, in existence. And there is a website that you can go to in order to get information about joining. I believe it's uh, thephylaxics.org, T-H-E, P H Y L A X I S dot O R G. Uh, and it, uh, you can eventually get information about becoming a member. But uh, basically, um, you're going to want to subscribe to the magazine. Um, that is the primary benefit of membership. Uh, you subscribe to the membership. The uh, the cost is thirty five dollars a year, um, which is not enough to sustain the society. And I believe there may be um, an increase to that uh, in the near future. But um, it's a it's a wonderful um, organization for 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 masons. 
the Phylaxic Society has recently began to print their earlier magazines uh, in a collection, 10 magazines per volume. And um, right now there are only three volumes available, but uh, those volumes are, they are astounding. I especially like the second volume, uh, which really opened up, that, that's the one that contains the, the articles that I talked about uh, tonight. And uh, that's really how I became aware of it. But um, those, I think they're available for, for like $35 each. If you, um, you can get, you can order those on the uh, website also. Let me announce that the society normally meets annually in March, uh, as close to March 6th as, as possible. The annual convention for 2021 um, has, it hasn't, it, it, we're not going to have uh, an in-person meeting. Uh, that was recently announced. Uh, there will probably be, be some kind of virtual meeting. Um, I, I, it really breaks my heart because that is usually uh, the, the convention that I look forward to most of all uh, in my travels. Um, I went to a convention, I can't remember how long it, ago it was, but I became addicted to it. I have never missed one since. But um, 2021, it's going to be a different kind of show, but um, go to the website, thephylaxics.org, and uh, you should be able to get a lot more information about what's going on. Uh, thank you, brother. Um, yeah, and I just urge everyone to go out there, do that, do the research, and become a uh, become a member. All right, so uh, we're at the part of our show where we usually do closing um, closing thoughts, you know, for the evening, and we'll start out with our special guest this evening, Brother Williams. Any closing thoughts as we wrap up this evening? Well, uh, Brother Morgan mentioned uh, that there are some other books that I've been involved with. Uh, there is a website, uh, the one that has been flashing when um, the book, uh, The Prince All Story Revisited. Um, I believe it's, uh, yes, that's the book. And the, um, the website is phstory.org. I think that's it. You can go to that uh, website and um, get not only The Prince All Story Revisited, but some of my other writings as as well. And uh, I, I'm not a one topic uh, guy. I, I, I know that uh, some of you have only associated me with uh, with Grimshaw, but uh, I've had a lot of other interests, uh, including um, uh, black history. And uh, I've got another book that uh, has a lot of lectures um, well, not a lot of lectures. There's 14 lectures, and about five of them are uh, about Black history that uh, some of you may be interested in reading about, uh, about uh, civiliz Nubian civilizations, the Olmecs, uh, and a few other things that uh, might be of interest. Um, anyway, uh, check out the website. You may see something that uh, you'll enjoy. Okay. Thank you, Brother Williams. Uh, Brother Morgan, closing thoughts this evening. Um, again, I just want to thank Brother Williams for um, for being here with us uh, this evening um, and sharing in this dialogue. As, as the the, pan, the co panelists know, I've been wanting to do this topic and get Brother Williams on for for quite a long time. Um, uh, okay, I guess we, we lost Dave. He must he must have heard that. Uh, I was going to say something about the Knicks. Anyway, <laughs> um, in, any, in any event, I uh, just want to thank everybody for being here uh, with us. Uh, okay, we got Dave back. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here with us. And, and I want to publicly thank uh, Brother Jack, Brother Caffey, and Brother Gillarm for last night. Uh, many of you may not know that uh, last night there was a special uh, episode workshop, uh, fireside. We, we called it the Fireside Chat. Uh, that was held 
um, with the Prince Hall Think Tank being hosted by the jurisdiction of the District of Columbia uh, at the request of my most worshipful Grand Master, the Honorable Quincy G. Gant. Um, he, he hosted the four of us to do a workshop uh, on Masonic education with the brothers and sisters of the District of Columbia. Uh, I think it was outstanding. Uh, we've been getting nothing but positive emails and praise for it from, uh, from the brothers and the sisters uh, there in attendance. And so uh, we're probably going to uh, maybe edit that video a little bit or do something with it and maybe upload it at a later date uh, so everyone else can check it out. But, um, but I want to thank you all so much for, for the, assisting uh, us with that. Uh, it was something that, as you, you three know, was long long time coming. Um, yes. And I'm glad we were able to get it done. And hopefully it won't be the last time uh, that we do that for a particular jurisdiction uh, in a more kind of intimate setting. So thank you. And I'll see everybody next month. Definitely. Thank you, Brother Morgan. Brother Jack. As always, uh, it has been an honor and a pleasure to uh, be a part of uh, this great show. This is um, this is this has been uh, a great show. Um, I, I think we, you know, were able to uh, discuss a lot and put really put a lot out in the open. Um, brother, uh, brother Williams, thank you so much for. Um, for for your tutelage, for your uh, for your 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 great uh, presentation, truly uh, truly enjoyed it. Uh, definitely um, outstanding. Uh, thank you to all who took the time out to uh, to watch the show this evening. Um, very very great dialogue um, that that went on. Um, and, and I'll just say when it comes to when it comes to information, um, when it comes to you know history. As we always say, trust and trust but verify. Um, um, brothers, re remember your name. You know, re remember your name, and that go. You know that that goes for everything. So before you put something, you know, before you put something out there, just make sure you're. You know, you were careful enough to um, look at, research, and, and make sure um, that it's right information before uh, you put it out there. If you don't, if you don't believe us. As uh, members of this think tank, just just look at Dave Gillarm. Every year he says that the Knicks going to be a championship. We've tried, you know, we you know, we hasn't been it hasn't been verified in over forty years. So you know, just 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 look at that. But once again, we thank you for uh, taking the time out. Look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you, brother. That's a good, great segue, actually, to Brother Gillon. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. You know it. You know. You know how I got to start it off. Next year is gonna be our year. I'm the that, That's it. It's gonna happen. We are gonna win a championship. Next, the world champions. But, but but who won the championship this year? That's what I want to know, Dave. Uh, it seems like it was fake news. I don't oh think yeah, it really happened. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> the Los Angeles Lakers. In case you forgot, I'm just letting you know. Just letting uh, you know. All right, but well, serious though. Uh, like joining the Flat Society is a great thing. Um. I believe I had a, a conversation with brother Carlos Sanchez uh, roughly about eight years ago, eight, nine years ago. And he was the one who uh, told me, well, well basically he was like, why aren't you already a member of the Flex Society? And um, when I started looking at the stuff that he was writing, the stuff that he was putting out, uh, I did it immediately. And the next, the next thing he told me to do was go on the website, find all the back editions I can and order them. And I did it. Uh, but I believe, I believe I talked about that on a previous show. That was probably one of the best things that I have done in my Masonic career. Uh, those old editions of the Flaxus magazine have some true gems in it. We talk about stuff from the late seventies, early eighties time frame uh, stuff. So when you see that see that Joseph Walks was the president at the time, the magazine. I mean, it, it was an absolute gold mine. Uh, if I was at home, I would probably put out the magazine that I have with Brother Williams on the front cover of it. Uh, I, it, it was that that was like a, gr a great thing to join, not jo join the Flax Society and uh, ordering all those back editions of the Flax magazine. Um, as far as the show, hope you all learned something. Uh, I did. I definitely did. Um, it, to me, it was a great show. Great, great topic. And it's going to it's going to um, hold up. We're gonna have to hold ourselves accountable now. Um, we we know that stuff, that stuff that Grimshaw had put out is wrong or not entirely correct. And so it becomes, it comes our duty to fact check it and put out the correct information. Um, and that's on all of us to do that. Um, and as always look forward. To, oh, okay. 
can't forget this because I had a lot of questions about this sweatshirt. Um, we still um, uh, we're still talking about how we're, how we're gonna uh, do mass orders um, and talking to um, uh, Miss Kimberly who owns uh, Crush Tees. Uh, uh, we talked about this the other night about how uh, possibly creating a website to get these orders out. This was literally a spur of the moment. They the other palace didn't didn't even really know about it. Um, I just wanted to get a hoodie. I'm out here in Colorado Springs. It's cold out here. If you looked on my Facebook page, you saw I don't know what kind of winter wonderland that we have going on right now. Uh, so uh, that damn book said it's your fault. Yeah. So I I, I I I just really did the spread of the moment, but um, we we're definitely gonna get that information out there everybody, to everybody about how to order um, uh, hoodies, t-shirts, or whatever else that that we decide to come up with. And as always, go next. <laughs> All right. Thanks, brothers. And uh, again, thank you, Brother Williams, for joining us this evening um, and, and, and definitely uh, contributing um, to the conversation with your great research. You know, it's, 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 as it's been stated tonight, uh, it's imperative that we, um, we, we get our history right. You know, it, it's imperative that we tell our history the right way so that the world truly know, you know and understand the greatness of Prince R. Freemasonry. Uh, thank you for joining us again tonight. We hope you've learned a little something and gained a little insight. Please, 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 if you haven't already done so, please go out and vote. Um, early vote. Submit your, um, your 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 absentee ballot. You know, the big thing is, like they said, come up with a plan on not only um, making sure that you vote, making sure everyone in your household vote. Um, if you have loved ones, get on the phone. You know, make sure they're getting to the polls and, and voting as well and just come up with a plan uh, to exercise your right to vote. So please get out there and vote. Have a good evening. And remember, let's teach masonry in our lodges. Good night.